Hello everyone, welcome to this lecture. So, in this lecture we will introduce the problem of perfectly secure message transmission or PSMT and we will discuss two variants of this problem namely the one round PSMT problem and multi round PSMT problem. So, this PSMT problem a perfectly secure message transmission problem is a variation of the PRMT problem which we had discussed in the earlier lecture. So, in that problem we had abstracted the underlying network as a collection of node disjoint wires between two parties a sender and a receiver and up to T wires could be under the control of a computationally unbounded Byzantine adversary where the communication over those wires can be arbitrarily changed. And now in the new problem PSMT we have two goals to achieve. We want to securely communicate a message from the sender to receiver irrespective of the way the corrupt channels or the channels which are under the control of the adversary behaves. The two goals are the following. The receiver should be able to obtain the sender's message correctly without any error. So, that is same as PRMT, but in the PRMT problem in the PRMT protocol it is fine if the receive if the adversary learns the message and in fact if you recall the protocol the knife PRMT protocol where sender simply sends its message over all the end channels adversary also will be knowing the sender's message. There the goal was not secure privacy there the goal was only reliability, but now in the PSMT problem we also have another goal namely privacy. Namely in the protocol whatever information adversary sees over the T channels T wires that should be independent of sender's message. Okay. So, PSMT minus privacy is same as PRMT that means if you just want reliable communication but you are fine to compromise the privacy then you can use PRMT protocols, but if you also want privacy on top of reliability then you have to go for PSMT protocol. And since we are assuming here computationally unbounded adversary we cannot deploy cryptographic tools here. Okay. Because oh, and when I say cryptographic tools I mean traditional encryption schemes because the security of all these encryption schemes the traditional encryption schemes hold under the assumption that adversary is computationally bounded. Okay. Now, there are two variants of the PSMT problem one round PSMT pro problem protocol means when I say I have a one round PSMT protocol by that I mean that my protocol will now operate in a scenario where the wires are unidirectional from sender to receiver that means only sender can communicate to the receiver over those channels and backward communication is not possible. This models communications in directed graphs. Okay. Say for instance sender is a base station and it has only the capability to broadcast or send some communication to the receiving parties, but the other way around communication may not be possible. So, such scenarios are modeled by this uh, unidirectional wire model and in such models we can only design a one round PSMT protocol. Why one round? Because the protocol will be a single shot protocol where only there will be one round of communication from the sender to the receiver over the wires and the protocol terminates. Whereas, when we talk about multi round PSMT protocol then we assume that the communication channel between the sender and the receiver are bi directional that means 
sender can send some information to receiver and then receiver can see and feedback and then again in the next round sender can communicate and then again in the next round receiver can send feedback and so on. That means interaction in both the directions is possible. And this models communications in undirected graphs where there is no direction associated with the underlying links. So, now let us first focus on one round PSMT uh, and we can prove a very simple necessary condition for the existence of one round PSMT protocols. So, we can show that one round PSMT protocol is possible to design only if there exist at least 3 T plus 1 unidirectional wires from the sender to receiver. If there are T 3 T or less than 3 T number of wires between from sender to receiver, then one round PSMT protocol can never be possible. Okay. And the proof will be through a contradiction. So, what we basically we will show is the following. Imagine you have some abstract one round PSMT protocol, let us denote it by pi. We do not know what exactly are the operations done as per the protocol pi. We only know that pi allows sender to, to compute some messages which it can communicate over the n wires and even if up to t wires change the contents of the communications. Okay. Even if the contents over the t wires get changed, receiver will somehow be, be able to recover back the message by applying the protocol pi by executing the steps of the protocol pi assigned to the receiver. That is what we assume. Now, what we are going to show is the following. We will argue that in protocol pi, the distribution namely the probability distribution of the messages over any subset of n minus 2 t wires, that probability distribution has to depend on sender's message. Now, what does that mean? First of all, any PSMT protocol has to be randomized. And what does that mean? That means, even if sender wants to send the same message m multiple times, say Monday it wants to send a message m, Tuesday again it wants to send a message m, Wednesday again it wants to send a message m, then the protocol pi should be randomized in the sense that first time it wants to send a message m, the contents over the wires w1 should be say m1, m2, m, n, m, m, m i, m n. Second time it wants to send a message, the content should be m1 prime, m2 prime, m n prime. That means, every time sender runs the protocol pi, the the values which sender sends the over the wires, they will be different with high probability. It would not be the same set of values which it will be sending over all every wire or different wires every time it has to send the same message. It is not going to be a deterministic protocol. Why that is the case? Because if the protocol pi is a deterministic protocol and if pi is a deterministic protocol, pi is a deterministic protocol, then it implies that contents over T wires deterministically depends upon sender's message, but that will simply violate the privacy property. Because now, if adversary controls some set of T wires and if again and again it sees the same contents being communicated over those T wires, then it can sense that sender is sending the same message, sender's input is the same message which it is trying to communicate to the receiver and that itself is a violation of the privacy. When I say privacy, remember the definition of privacy is that even if sender adversary controls any subset of T wires, whatever information it learns, its 
distribution should be completely independent of the sender's message. That means, even the fact that sender's message is repeated should not be revealed to the adversary and that is possible only when your protocol pi is a randomized protocol. That means, if we view the set of information which will be communicated over different set of wires by considering all possible executions of the protocol pi over all possible inputs, then that constitutes a probability distribution because different values will be obtained with different probabilities. So, now what we are going to claim here is that in the protocol pi the distribution of information which is communicated over any subset of n minus 2 t wires. If we take the probability distribution of only that subset of wires that has to depend on sender's message, it cannot be independent of sender's message. Now, assume this statement is true for the moment, assume this is true, we will soon prove this, assume this is true. Then in order that the privacy property is satisfied in the protocol pi, the condition n minus 2 t should be and the condition n minus 2 t greater than t should hold because adversary will control t wires and if n minus 2 t is less than equal to t and anyhow we are assuming that the probability distribution over the subset of n minus 2 t wires is dependent on sender's message, then basically by observing what is happening over those n minus 2 t wires, adversary will be able to completely figure out what is sender's message and that goes against the privacy requirement. That means, assuming that the distribution over the subset of n minus 2 t wires is dependent on sender's message if at all the protocol pi satisfies the privacy property, this condition has to be ensured. That means, whatever adversary observes that has to be strictly less than the contents which depends upon the sender's message. That is basically is the idea. Now, how do we prove this? That in the protocol pi, whatever information is communicated over any subset, I stress any subset of n minus 2 t wires is dependent on sender's message, well we will prove it through a contradiction. So, imagine that this is not the case that means, in the protocol pi the probability distribution of the information which is communicated over any subset of n minus 2 t wires is independent of sender's message. That means, it does not matter whether sender's message is x or y the contents over some subset of n minus 2 t wires will be the same with same probability. Okay. So, consider this execution for the protocol pi execution E 1, where sender's input was some message m, it runs the protocol pi, it computes the triplet of information alpha, beta and gamma. Okay. And the contents alpha is communicated over the first T wires, the content beta is communicated over the next T wires and the content gamma is communicated over the n minus t 2 T wires. Okay. So, total there are n wires okay. and alpha denotes whatever total content is communicated over the first T wires. Okay. I am not denoting, I am not showing the contents wire wise, but over the full subset of T wires that is denote that is denoted by alpha, whatever communication happens over the next T wires that is denoted by beta and whatever communication happens over the last n minus 2 T wires that is denoted by gamma. That is the case in the execution E 1, alpha will occur with some probability. Okay. 
beta is occurring with some probability, gamma is occurring with some probability and since it is a one round protocol there is no mechanism for the receiver to send back any feedback. Receiver whatever alpha, beta, gamma it receives it will be running the protocol pi and as since the protocol pi is a PSMT protocol it should satisfy the reliability property that means it should be able to recover back the message m. Now consider another execution E2 for the same protocol pi where now the sender's message is m prime. And now suppose when it runs the protocol pi with its input m prime the contents over the first t wires turn out to be alpha prime with some probability the contents over the next t wires turns out to be beta prime with some probability and the contents over the last n minus 2 t wires turns out to be gamma only. Now you might be wondering that since, since sender's message is m prime how can gamma occur both during the execution of pi for m as well as m prime well that is what we are assuming here when we are assuming a contradiction to our claim. We assumed that the probability distribution of information communicated over any subset of n minus 2 t wires is independent of sender's message that means it does not matter whether sender's message is m or whether sender's message is m prime with whatever probability gamma a candidate gamma occurs over this n minus 2 t wires during the execution E1 with the same probability gamma will occur as a candidate for the information communicated over the last n minus 2 t wires in the execution E2 right. Now even in this execution E2 even if receiver receives alpha prime, beta prime and gamma and if it runs the protocol pi it should be able to recover back m prime okay. I stress neither in E1 nor in E2 any corruption occurs. That means alpha, beta and gamma goes as it is the Byzantine corrupt wires do not do any harm over the channels receiver receives alpha, beta and gamma applies pi and recovers m and in execution E2 again the adversary cause causes no harm it simply listens over the channel over the channels which it is controlling receiver receives alpha prime, beta prime and gamma applies the protocol pi and recovers pi. Now consider another execution E3 of pi where sender has again an input m it runs the protocol pi and again it turns out that the contents for the first t wires turns out to be alpha the contents for the next t wires turn out to be beta and the contents for the last n minus 2 t wires turns out to be gamma again it can occur with some non zero probability but now the byzantine adversary controls the first t wires and it changes the contents alpha to alpha prime and delivers it to the receiver. Now what will be the receiver's viewpoint? The receiver's viewpoint is that it is receiving the triplet of information alpha prime, beta and gamma and it is now totally confused whether it is seeing an execution E1 where the first t wires would have sent alpha that means they are supposed to deliver alpha but adversary has changed them to alpha prime or whether it is execution E2 where sender has sent beta prime over the next t wires and an adversary sitting over those t wires have changed it to beta. From the viewpoint of the receiver he is completely clueless whether it is the scenario 1 or whether this is scenario 2 because it does not know what was sender's input and it does not know which wires are under the control of the adversary. 
So, with equal probability receiver should have output m as well as m prime right. So, receiver is clueless it can output m with probability half and m prime with probability half, but that goes against the reliability condition. The reliability condition demands that irrespective of what adversary does over the T channels receiver should be able to recover back the sender's message, but if this scenario happens then receiver cannot do anything. It can only say oh I think I am in execution E 1 and it is only the first T wires who have changed the corruption who have done the corruption and change it to alpha prime, but it could also be the case that actually senders input was M prime and sender has actually done the execution E 2 and beta prime has been changed to beta that could also be the case. So, if senders if receivers action is always to output M 1 then consider another execution where senders input was M prime and the middle T wires change their contents from beta prime to beta in that case receiver will be still outputting m instead of m prime and that goes against the reliability condition and that shows that whatever contradictory statement we assumed here is incorrect and that shows that the probability distribution over any subset of n minus 2 t wires in any one round psmt protocol has to depend on sender's message and as a result of that the condition n minus 2 t strictly greater than t should hold implying that n greater than 3 t. Okay. Now, let me quickly go through the necessity condition for multi round PSMT protocol and we can easily prove that in any multi round PSMT protocol the condition n greater than 2 t should hold. This we can argue by showing that if we take any arbitrary multi round PSMT protocol, then the probability distribution over the information communicated over any set of n minus t wires has to depend on sender's message. If this is not correct, that means the information communicated over any subset of n minus t wires does not determine sender's message does not depend on sender's message, then the adversary can simply do the following. It can simply block the communication over the T wires throughout the protocol and now the receiver will be receiving only a truncated communication over n minus T wires and if the truncated communication is independent of sender's message, how at the first place receiver will be able to recover the message. It will simply fail to recover the message if that truncated communication over the n minus t clean wires fails to determine sender's message unambiguously. That means, this statement is true, but if this statement is true then for privacy we require the condition n minus t to should be to be strictly greater than t. Because if this is not correct, if n minus t is equal to t that means, the information over n minus t wires is sufficient to determine sender's message and if t is equal to n minus t then adversary can also eavesdrop that much amount of information and it can completely find out what was sender's message which goes against the privacy requirement. Okay. So, we have seen today the necessity condition for one round PSMT protocol it is n greater than 3 t. We have also seen the necessity condition for multi round PSMT protocol it is n greater than 2 t and you can see there is a trade off trade off between the number of faults number of corrupt wires and number of rounds. namely if you allow interaction between sender and receiver namely if the channels are bidirectional okay interaction allowed interaction allowed 
then you can design a protocol even if up to 49 percent of the channels are corrupt. But if interaction is not allowed, namely only sender can communicate to receiver, interaction not allowed, then you can design a protocol if only up to 33 percent of the channels are corrupt. So, depending upon whether interaction is allowed or not, the percentage of corrupt channels which you can tolerate in the protocol varies. So, these are the references where you can find more about uh, perfectly secure message transmission problem, the underlying necessary condition. The problem was introduced in the seminal work by D. Dolev, D. Work, Watts and Young in 1993 and my entire PhD thesis was explicitly on this problem of PRMT and PSMT. So, you can get more details and this thesis is publicly available. Thank you.